Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to the Midweek Supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's episode number 99, and I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Thank you for joining us. The Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting. And 99, Bob, I'm not good with math, but I think 100 is pretty close. (laughs) Yeah, it is close. Uh, This is really exciting to me. I can't believe the numbers keep creeping up, Jim, and we just keep having fun with this. Yeah. Well, a milestone for a lot of podcasters, 100. And we've got a little something special. Maybe folks won't think it's that special <laughs> when they hear what it is, but uh, we won't we won't spoil it r- right now. We'll let the uh, the cat out of the bag on number one hundred, I guess, right? Yep, yep, that's right. And Jim, I want to thank you personally because uh, when we first started this, I had made a New Year's resolution uh, a year and change back, where I was like, I want to be more consistent, and we've done almost a hundred of these, and I don't think I've done one hundred of much, you know, right. of anything <laughs> right. in my right. life. So right. I thank you, sir. Well, that's been our uh, our our collaborative goal uh, yep. to to be out weekly when we started, and then uh, as the interviews, you know, kept getting more in depth, and uh, we were learning so much from the knife makers. But there was other knife news to talk about. We were mm-hmm. like, well, gosh, what do we do? So we added the midweek supplemental. I can't remember how long ago, but. Uh, Two opportunities to be consistent, and uh, so far, <laughs> knock on wood, we've been consistent. So that's right, that's right. Yeah. So thank our listeners for uh, for being on that. Uh, I hate to use your word journey, uh, <laughs> but our, that listening journey with us. Yes, thank you for joining us on our journey. All right. So what's coming up this week on episode number ninety nine? Well, we're going to uh, unfortunately talk a little bit about the uh, coronavirus, but uh, a, a different take on it uh, this time. Uh, we're going to cover some stories and uh, knife life news about uh, four different things we want to look at. Bob's got a, a different take on the state of the collection. And we're also going to have our first tool segment this week where we look at the multi-tool. So a lot of good stuff coming up this week, Bob. Uh-huh. Yeah, actually, that will be the Leatherman in particular, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, the multi-tool of, of, the, uh, of the last 20 years, I'd have to say. Okay. Um, but uh, before we get going, I just want to say um, just a big shout out to first responders out there. I know we have some that listen. Our good friend Stu is a police officer. I know there are others. Um, we've had my friend Mike, uh, listening. He's also a police officer and, uh, everyone else, firefighters, 911 call takers, hospital workers, people in the food industry, people delivering our, our valuable valuables that we can't go to the store to get everyone who's out there still working. Uh, I just want to give you all a big shout out because, you know, uh, you're seeing everyone else hunkering down. You're seeing everyone else trying to stay healthy and you're out there in the mix as am I, as a, as is Jim. And, uh, you know, there's something to that. You're, you're helping things go. You're helping things get better. Just like the people staying home are helping things get better. So just a shout out to you. That's why I wanted to do a first tool on the Leatherman. Uh, it's a, it's something we all have, but it's something that first responders rely on. Uh, I've, I've seen it firsthand and, um, uh, I just want to I just want to say thank you to everyone keeping the nation running. Well, a lot of the uh, folks that are continue continuing to work are the ones that don't often get the thank yous or the get the recognition. So I uh, definitely want to say thank you. But if you can stay home, do stay home uh, and help uh, stop the spread. Definitely uh, different uh, trying times we're going through with this uh, coronavirus COVID-19 and uh, would love to hear some stories from knife makers or knife designers, knife companies. You know, what are you going through during this time? You know, has it affected your operations? What are you doing? You know, has your knife making and production slowed down? Give us a call on the uh, listener line at 724-466-4487. That's 724-466-4487. We would love to uh, hear from you how you are, are dealing with this situation. Yeah, and to first responders, I'd love to hear how you are actually in the field using your knives or multi-tools. That would just be interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, and speaking of the listener line, we do have a uh, listener line call that we're going to play this uh, this episode coming up uh, about the um, warranty work, I guess, with a knife company. So an interesting uh, interesting story to hear on that. So uh, 
What do you say we uh, get into our our show with Knife Life News, Bob? Well, let's talk about the new uh, Boker Traditional that just came out. Uh, these are some stories I picked up from Knife News. I want to thank Ben Schwartz over at uh, Knife News. He, man, he keeps me informed. And what great, great articles and great curation on his site. The first uh, is the Boker. Uh, tradi- it's a new traditional called the Caballero, which means uh, cowboy in Spanish. Uh, but this is uh, sort of a... Another modern material take on a traditional, but this is a backlock. And the interesting feature about this is that it doesn't have the same sort of traditional uh, leaf spring, uh, which can be heavy and can add, you know, can add weight and and width to a knife. They added a uh, a wire bail, so something more akin to a a light wire spring. Uh, in there to unlock it. It makes it lighter and it keeps the package overall smaller. The package, by the way, is 2.7 ounces and it's got a three inch, what is it? A three inch drop point uh, blade. But the really interesting and Cocobolo handle, which is quite fetching if you ask me. But the really interesting thing about this, the USP to this knife is uh, this, the, the way they changed the spring. Uh, and they actually patented it. So it's their own patented Boker backlock mechanism. Uh, using a uh, using a wire bail instead of a big heavy leaf spring. So interesting. That should be out in May. Coca bola handle. Coca bolo. Yeah, it's that. Beautiful, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful wood. I think it's South American, mm-hmm. but don't quote me on that. Okay, but it's, so it's wood. Yeah, yeah, it's wood, and it's got a really beautiful, warm kind of amber tone, mm. reddish amber tone. Yeah, sounds nice. It is. It feels good in the hand too. Okay. All right. Uh, coming up next, uh, Knife Life News, uh, one of your favorite brands, Tops, I think. Oh, yeah. So so this is blending two of my favorite things, Tops knives and straight razors. I say that I don't have much expertise uh, with a straight razor, and I, I only have a couple of uh, old antique ones that are kind of past their prime. Uh, they've been sharpened so much, they're like wedges now. But this Tops Tack Raise, uh, this, this is... The first friction folder in their line was the Tack Raise 1, and it was uh, a recurve blade in a friction folder, and, you know, it's very evocative of a straight razor uh, that you would shave with. They just came out with a new model for the line, so now, they're ha- now they have two blade shapes in this series, and it's the Tack Raise that looks like a razor. It's got a big, flat, rectangular-shaped blade. And uh, apparently it's pretty thick behind the edge and, and they don't recommend you try and shave with it. It's not for that. It's, it's more for light EDC tasks. But you keep it in a, in a horizontal riding leather pouch. Well, actually, it can ride horizontally or vertically, I believe. And on this new one, instead of black G10, which is kind of a plain, plain Jane handle material, you get uh, olive green micarta handles, uh, which you know I love. So this thing uh, looks really interesting to me. I, I wouldn't mind checking this out, uh, but y- you know, I, you could catch me saying that about any Topps knife. I, true, I'm, true. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not so uh, into the friction folder idea, so it would be cool to have just out of interest because I have an interest in making them as a gateway folder, but not so much an interest in carrying them. So it might be a cool thing for me to have just as research, mm. you know, maybe I should get well, it for research. Well, of course, yes, absolutely. Well, then you mentioned the uh, the straight razor and, you know, having a few of them, but not going hog wild, if you will, on the collection. Yep. Perhaps that's because you only shave six months out of the year. <laughs> yeah, that could be it. That right. could be it. But uh, it might make me a bit more manly if if when I do shave, I used a straight razor. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Whack, whack, whack. yeah. Yeah. Without the foam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you it's, go. It's all just style. I don't care how much it hurts. That's right. There you go. All right. Well, you mentioned kitchen, uh, kitchen knives, a new line of kitchen knives for real steel. Yes, sir. One of my uh, favorite designers. Well, I shouldn't say favorite designers, but uh, Ostop. Aren't aren't they all your favorite designers? Yeah, exactly. Ostop Hell is such a unique. He does a lot of uh, stuff for real steel. He makes such unique designs. And and to me, they're very, very beautiful. To say he's my favorite designer uh, wouldn't be true because I the one Ostop Hell I had, I got rid of the Metamorph. What a great front flipping knife. Uh, However, I did stab my palm with it a bunch of times. So I kind of felt like it didn't like me. Uh, But Ostop Hell just came out with uh, three kitchen knives for real steel. And they are really beautiful. They kind of have his angular sort of modern take 
on the traditional uh, Japanese Santoku style um, chef's chef's knife, kitchen knife. Uh, these are made in 14C28N, and they have black G10 handles. They're they're full tang construction, three pin, and uh, they are okay. They're really cool. They look like the kitchen version of the Metamorph. The large kitchen, uh, the large chef's knife, which is about what is it, 11 and a half inches long, has really thick blade steel, which is kind of an interesting choice for a uh, a chef's knife. But it is significantly narrowed to the point. So I'm not sure exactly if, I mean, not to the point, to the edge. So I'm not sure if that creates a, a very sharp wedge that sort of moves material out of the way. I don't know if you know, if you cut a lot of vegetables, but sometimes the, the say, cucumber will stick to the side of the blade and it's kind of uh, perpendicular to the cutting board. So as you do it, it, they start stacking up on the blade and falling over on the wrong side. Well, if it's more wedge-ish, uh, maybe it, it shears off to the side. That's what I'm wondering. Like mm. for the choice for the thicker blade right. steel for the larger. Interesting. Yeah. And then they have a, a, a mid range utility knife and then a small paring knife and they all look beautiful and they get progr- progressively more thin in terms of blade steel. I've had the same set of kitchen knives since we got married 15 years ago. And I'm sorry, 13 years ago. Sorry, baby. And, uh, uh, it's, it's the shun model by Kai. And I'm not so keen on them. They're all right, but they don't really keep an edge very well. And I've been toying around with the idea for years of getting new kitchen knives. And when I saw this article, I was it was the first time I was actually thinking of spending my money on kitchen knives instead of a hmm. you know a new folding knife. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, hey, uh, two of the knives you've mentioned so far have black G10 handles. Mm-hmm. Uh, kitchen knives. That seems reasonable. You know, you wouldn't have fancy materials, fancy colors in the kitchen. Maybe some folks would want that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just your your reaction to that? Actually, that's a that's that's a great uh, thought because you know I could see G10 comes in all sorts of colors. So if you wanted the color, uh, you know, that's fine, and and that could be easy to get. But yes, G10 on a kitchen knife does sound like a great idea because it is you know epoxy resin. Uh, glass filled. Well, I don't know if it's glass filled, but it's it's impervious. It's an impervious epoxy material, and mm-hmm. and uh, if it ends up in the dishwasher, which knives should never go in the dishwasher, but oh, if really? it does end, yeah, like kitchen knives, chef's knives, and stuff like that. Yeah, don't do that. Um, it, it'll jack up the handles. No comment. No comment. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed loose handle scales. It might happen with wooden handles. Mm-hmm. But my point is, like a modern a modern composite material like that will probably fare well with all of the because it's you can spill gas on it you can get oil on it you can get any sort of crap on it out in the field so in the kitchen any sort of acidic or hot or whatever Mm -hmm. material is going to be is is going to be shrugged off by the g10 so interesting thought well well, i yeah well then they i think will probably Maybe they already are having colored handles because, you know, a lot of the appliances uh, integrate color and those kind of things. So you could have a, you know, air quote designer kitchen and yeah. therefore charge more money for your colored handles probably. That's since right. They're, since they're designer. Yeah. Well, they they could get together with Cuisinart. Well, I guess Cuisinart probably has its own line of knives. But they get it, you know, with one yeah. of these companies that, that puts their KitchenAid, all their mixers yeah. in the different colors. That's a good idea. Interesting. Yeah. Cross right. marketing. That's right. I'm, I'm I'm getting on the phone with Real Steel right after we're done. That's right. We're going to start another business. <laughs> All right. A uh, name that unfortunately I have a hard time with, Shirogorov. Yeah, right? yeah. Shirogorov Quantum. And, and, if, and if you feel unsure about it, just just sound cool and say, Shiro. It's a Shiro, bro. And people oh, yeah, like, Shiro. Oh, man, okay. he really knows what he's talking the about. The Shiro Quantum. Yes. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Shirogorov, Russian knife company that is Sergei Shirogorov is a custom knife maker, and he has several tiers of knives that he produces in his business. Uh, some of them are are serial production. Some of them are custom shop, which is or custom division, which is a smaller uh, uh, division where more care is put into the knives, basically, and and better materials and components. And then his custom. So this is a new one uh, coming out called the Quantum, and it's going into regular serial production, and it is. Uh, gorgeous it 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 speaks the you look at the handle for sure it looks like a shiragorov the um the blade is a departure uh it, instead of that beautiful classic uh, drop point they use uh oftentimes this is a this is a trailing point blade and it 
you know, it, it, it looks to me a little Persian-y, even though, even though the uh, spine doesn't quite curve back, but it, it has this beautiful sweep up to the, to the acute point. And it's got this interesting divot sort of notched into the blade where the spidey hole would be or the thumb stub would be. And the shape of this thing, shape of this groove, it's like a fuller, but it's, it's, in, a, it's in a different place. And, and the line of that continues onto the handle in this graceful sweep. It's a really gorgeous knife. Uh, 3.74 inch blade. So this is kind of a large knife for EDC. EDC is usually, you know, roughly 3.25 to three and a half or, or three to three and a half inches. Well, this is up in that kind of larger range, but the intention for this is uh, is EDC, apparently. Sergei Shergorov himself carried it around, carried some prototypes of this, this around quite a bit to test them out in, uh, in tough sort of uh, tasks for four weeks on end, apparently. And um, with a mind to make this not a not a heavy use or not a fighting knife, but a, an EDC. Anyway, uh, titanium lock bar. It's got the multi-row bearing system, and uh, you can open it using it using the uh, the flipper tab, or you can you can wedge your finger in that little uh, fuller I was talking about to flip it open. I talk about Shirogrovs here and there, but I don't know something about this one has me has me pretty excited. I think it's because it's large, mm -hmm. uh, like like most of them, but it's also a, just a different shape. I don't know. It's, it's it's pretty beautiful. It's the big boys everyday carry. The big boys everyday carry. <laughs> and if we if we have any Shirogorov uh, aficionados out there, please please chime in because I, I know very little about them firsthand. I've I've read about them and I find them interesting. Uh, but let's let's hear from from Shirogorov fans out there. You know about what I need to know. <laughs> I'm sure there's a book <laughs> right. of what I need to know. But uh, interesting uh, directions to point me in anyway. We'll leave a uh, brief message about what Bob needs to know on the listener line at 724-466-4487, <laughs> Maybe your uh, your top tip about Shirogorov for Bob to uh, to learn or just to share with all of our listeners. I did want to ask you, Bob, of yeah. the uh, the Boker knife, the Topps knife, and the Shirogorov. If mm -hmm. you had to choose one to add to your list, what would it be? <laughs> the Shirogorov. Your, your, your purchase list. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, the reason I'm asking people to sound off on this is, is well, it's twofold. First, to you know, uh, inform the listening public, but also I'm, I'm, I've been slowly kind of headed in the direction to buying a Shirogorov at some point, and uh, I, I just kind of, you know, I, I, I don't know much about them, and I'm kind of wide-eyed about it. So, mm. if anyone can point me in an interesting direction, that'd be cool. Help Bob buy his first Shiro. Shiro. How was that? Did that that was good. Cool? That was good. That was, that Thank was you. rad. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 99. 100 is coming up next in case you have math difficulties like I do. Uh -huh. I had to figure that one out last night. But 100 coming up next. We'll uh, announce a little something uh, special about that one. But, Bob, before we get into the first tool segment, mm -hmm. uh, we kind of touched on uh, at the beginning the COVID-19, the coronavirus. Shout outs to everybody that's having to work, doing their part, et cetera. But uh, also uh, kind of a different take you wanted to look at when, it, when you're talking about your state of the knife collection and the times we're going through now. Well, yeah, uh, maybe like many, my buying in the last couple of weeks has slowed down. You know, consciously, you, you, you don't want to... You're not sure what your resources are going to be in the future, so you don't want to blow it all on knives, basically. Uh, even though it, it trades great for survival food, apparently. Uh, but anyway, my buying had slowed down, and I've been thinking about, you know, digging out knives from the box that I haven't really used much and taking them out and actually using them. And I did that with the uh, large Recon 1 Bowie. We went out in the woods, me and the girls, and uh, uh, we wanted to get some bamboo, and I was using this knife to harvest bamboo. Like, we're, we're talking like inch-thick bamboo trees. We weren't harvesting them. That's kind of a dramatic... I, we got like three, three walking sticks. So, I, I chopped down three huge, trees. Huge collection. <laughs> harvesting. But uh, it was amazing how nicely, how nicely the, the Cold Steel Recon 1 XL Bowie, which is a big, broad fully flat ground blade, how nicely it just sliced right through bamboo. Now, I know bamboo is hollow, and I know bamboo is soft, and it's it's like 190% water, but still, what a, what a 
what a nice experience. And after banging it through a whole bunch of bamboo, because of course we had to break it down into different size pieces, the thing was totally rock solid. You know, that, that, um, that triad lock is no joke. And uh, a feature of it that I forgot about is that the more you bang on it, the more you use it, the kind of deeper it settles into itself. And uh, you could kind of kind of feel that. At first, uh, I, I held the blade and, and, and torqued it back and forth, and I thought I felt a rattle, and then, and then suddenly it locked in. And man, it's like a, it's like a fixed blade, man. So uh, yeah, all, all I'm saying is, uh, if don't be bummed if you're if you're if your collection has taken a hit and things are slowing down for you, or maybe you were really hot on something uh, right before things changed and um, you didn't get it. Well, you got other stuff, and it's all sweet. You know, you got it because it's cool, and you got it because it's good, and uh, it was the best you could get at the time or whatever. So, so take a look at it again. I mean. I don't mean to lecture you, I'm lecturing myself because I've spent an awful lot of money on knives that I don't use that much. And now is the time for me to uh, to tuck in, you know, to mm-hmm. slow down and, and, and appreciate. Well, uh, you know, maybe as we've talked about uh, previously, buy some accessories, maybe buy, uh, you know, new screws or... Exactly. Not thumb stud. What's the other one I'm looking for? Thumb... Thumb disc. Thumb disc. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or, you know, scales or different things like that to, to really customize some of the knives you have. That is an outstanding idea. Uh, I think um, well, we talked about that a bit with Alex. He does that with everything anyway. But uh, not only is that a great way for you to sort of uh, fine tune what you have and and maybe give it a, a new way to appreciate it, but also you're keeping small businesses going, you know, uh, you're keeping the the handle scale makers and the and the thumb stud makers or the thumb disc makers <laughs> and all the people who make these amazing this amazing hardware and uh, sort of ancillary products for knives keeping them going Absolutely. sheaths sheath makers i mean you can always use a new kydex sheet right well and if you don't have anything in particular in mind why not just buy a gift certificate or a gift card or you know that type of thing from yeah. a from a small producer or whatever, as you said, it's uh, it's critical that we all do what we can to uh, help each other out during these times, and uh, not only keeping ourselves safe, you know, physically and medically, but uh, you know, also also economically. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, in a way, I kind of feel like it's preaching to the choir here, Jim, because the knife community already is a very generous and and uh, I don't know. It seems like the the people we've met and and uh, the and the people that they know seem to seem to look out for one another, you know, in a virtual way. It's not like I can just pop in, a, you know, on Stu in Vermont. But, uh, you know, we pass an email every now and again, and it's just nice to know people are looking out. Right. Well, and uh, just an update, this uh, episode number 99 is coming out on April 1st. No fooling. Uh, at the time of this recording, Blade Show was still on. So we'll have to see what comes out in the next week or two. You know, uh, they're still hoping that uh, that June date will be uh, acceptable. I think the last email we saw from them was, you know, it's in Atlanta and, you know, convention space in that big city is hard to find uh, on a normal day. So uh, it seemed like if they couldn't pull it off this year, it wouldn't be rescheduled. It would just have to wait until next year. So uh, Hmm. fingers crossed, you know, that uh, we can get through this situation in time for the June Blade Show. Yeah. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Here's some cool knife history with the Knife Junkies, the first tool. Earlier, I mentioned first responders, and uh, that made me think of Leatherman, the Leatherman multi-tool. And it made me wonder where it came from and where the name came from. I felt really ignorant about this when I found this out, but uh, the Leatherman tool was invented by a mechanical engineer named Tim Leatherman. I think that's a really cool name to actually have, <laughs> Leatherman. So it, it was invented by this uh, mechanical engineer. He was he was on a road trip uh, with his wife in Europe in 1975. And you know what? I'm assuming it was his wife. I shouldn't do that. And uh, he was using a scout knife for everything, everything from fixing leaky hotel plumbing to fixing his, his uh, janky Fiat to cutting bread and cheese. And uh, oftentimes he found himself wishing he had pliers. So being a mechanical engineer, he started making some drawings while he was on this trip. And when he got back, he started working on a prototype. Now, he thought it would take him six months to get a prototype up and running. And it took him three years to make this thing and to get it patented or get it uh, filed for patent. 
And so he had this interesting device that was based around pliers, but had other tools in the handle. And he started uh, shopping it around, sending it to knife companies and tool companies, and no one bit. The tool companies thought, this thing is too much like a gadget. It's not a real tool. And the knife companies thought, this is a tool, not a knife. So no one wanted to make it. So uh, it took about three and a half years of him kind of passing this thing around and getting rejection letters uh, until he hooked up with a with a college buddy, Steve Berliner. And in 1983, uh, Leatherman Tools got their first order from Cabela's. Uh, Cabela's, we all know them. They're the famed outdoor store chain. Well, they ordered 500 from Leatherman. And uh, man, just as an aside, uh, Cabela's is a great company. They put out some really cool exclusives with knife companies, and they always seem to be active in that world, which means they must be active in all the other, you know, kind of product lines they represent, which is which is really outstanding. Anyway, the first production Leatherman tool was called the PST, the Pocket Survival Tool, and it had 13 tools, or no, 14 tools, I believe, in a four-inch package, you know, folded up into a four inch package, only five ounces fits in a nice leather, uh, little leather pouch you can put on your, on your hip. And for the first time, someone could walk around carrying, check this out, needle nose pliers, regular pliers, wire cutters, a hard wire cutter, clip point knife, metal slash wood file, an eight inch ruler, a can and bottle opener, small screwdriver, medium screwdriver, large screwdriver, Phillips number one and two, and an all punch. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> All based around pliers. And so uh, in that first year, they were om- uh, aiming to sell 4,000 of these things. And in their first year of production, they sold 30,000 of them. They were immediately embraced by a broad uh, spectrum of people from outdoorsmen to uh, tradesmen to mechanics and uh, hunters alike. So um, you will find them everywhere. And uh, I have one in each car. They, see, to me, now now that I've researched this and looked into this, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna have to get into Leatherman a little bit, maybe a little tiny sub collection because now I'm interested. I have one in each car. I have one in each uh, survival bag. I have one. You know, I, I have a million Leatherman that I never use. I have one in the kitchen that gets used a lot in the junk drawer. But uh, they have such a broad product line now. And they make everything, they make, they make uh, multi-tools based around pliers, as they always have, and then scissors, and then medical shears. I, I got the, uh, the medical shear version for a good buddy of mine, Kurt, who's been on the show. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just blown up into this uh, amazing company now. And they, they make like a, a million products. So yeah. uh, Leatherman, it's, it's not just the pliers, it's a whole bunch of stuff. And and to the Leatherman fans out there, the collectors out there, I don't mean to sound like a total noob, but I guess I am. I got to look deeper into into what they're making, you know. Well, very quickly, how does a Leatherman multi tool and the Swiss Army, which I consider a multi tool, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how do how do they compare? How do they differ? Well, I guess that the main thing is the is the main tool that they revolve around. On the Swiss Army knife, it revolves uh, around the large knife, blade, right? Yeah. In this, it, it revolves around the pliers. Hence the name Swiss Army Knife versus Multi-Tool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and you know what? It, it uh, That's another, man, that's another rabbit hole you can go down, Swiss Army Knives. And I've, I've, been, I've been flirting with that for a long time, too, because they're affordable and there's such a variety of them. If you have the instinct collect and you like knives, it's, it's kind of... It's kind of an easy, it's a, it's a slam dunk, you know, where, while you're on your way to your dream collection. Oh, maybe I'll just work on my Swiss Army knife collection for right. a while. Right. Uh, but, but I could see that happening with Leatherman. Yeah. And now they have this year, they're coming out with knife-based tools that look really cool. I've only mm-hmm. seen one or two reviews, but instead of revolving around the pliers or mm-hmm. the shears, it's revolving around the blade. So that would be the Leatherman multi knife tool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or knife multi tool or whatever. It, yeah. it does have a name, but I, I can't find it right now. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. All right. Moving on. Our last thing we wanted to cover this week is a uh, voicemail. We always encourage folks to give us a call on our listener line at 724 466 4487. 724 466 4487. And Aaron, a uh, listener, did just that. And he called in with a, about his experience with warranty service for his CQC 13, 
So we'll uh, listen to that and then come back with the Knife Junkies thoughts. Hey, Bob. It's Aaron from Missouri. Um, I was listening to the podcast on YouTube. So I wanted to talk about my Emerson CTC 13. Uh, it is a 2013 model. Uh, this is prior to the standoffs. Uh, this is back when they used a, uh, I believe it's a Dell run backspacer. Could be wrong on that. It might be G10. Not quite exactly sure. Anyway, uh, I wore the, uh, the titanium liner lock out. Uh, I sent it in. You know, I had a little bit of up and down blade play and what have you. Uh, it is a well-worn, uh, excuse my French, uh, B word. Okay. Biatch. Uh, I wear it every day. Uh, there is absolutely no finish on the clip whatsoever anymore. It was a, it was a well used knife. I sent it in, uh, on my own dime, of course. Uh, I, uh, gave them my, uh, credit card number, you know, of course, because I figured I had to pay, uh, to have them send it back after they did their, uh, you know, whatever fix they decided to do. What they did was, uh, they put a new titanium liner in it and they replaced all of the hardware. I mean all of it, uh, up to, I would say up to and including the pivot pin, but the pivot pin was perfect. Uh, I, w- I was just uh, gobsmacked but by the uh, warranty for such an old knife uh, that I have, uh, you know, road whore hard and uh, put up wet and what have you. Anyway, I uh, love the podcast. Uh, you're a good man. Uh, I was the guy that was trying to buy your uh Sax off you, by the way, on YouTube. Uh, anyway, love, love the podcast. Goodbye. All right. That was Aaron with the uh, voicemail there. Uh, some good experience, Bob, that he had with warranty work. Yeah. Well, having spoken with Ernest Emerson, uh, not to name drop, but having spoken with Ernest Emerson, uh, who's such an awesome and stand-up guy, I'm not surprised that the that the warranty service at his knife company is is top flight. I personally have never had to use... Any warranty service, actually. Wow. I, I've ordered new parts from Benchmade, but I've never sent a knife in. Um, so I don't really have much experience with it. I was about to send in my Microtech, and then right. I fixed it. But to hear to hear that uh, experience that, that Aaron had, it, it just goes to show, you know, if you have a problem with your knife, send it back to the manufacturer. If you have a problem with, if you have a problem with your Emerson, definitely send it to them. You know you'll get uh, first-class service. But the point is... You know, these companies make a lot of knives and they're made by humans and some things can get by, you know, have you ever made a mistake at work? Things can get by. So it can happen with a, with a, with a knife. It can happen, uh, you know, with a lock face. So just send it back. They'll be like, oh yeah. And they'll fix it and they'll send it back to you. So, um, warranty service is important. I hear about it a lot and you can find a lot of videos on YouTube of people, uh, of big time YouTubers anonymously sending uh, knives in for warranty service. And I, I can't really remember a bad a bad experience I've heard of. I know Kershaw, Kai does awesome, Spyderco, Benchmade, Emerson now, uh, Microtech. I know those companies all have excellent warranty service, and I'm sure the rest of them do too because they're all in business to stay in business. Right. right. And, and, and you want your product to be to live up to your name. So. Right. Well, they wouldn't be in business if they didn't take care of the business that they already had. So the hallmark of a good company is to uh, stand behind their product and uh, to do their warranty work. So that's yeah. awesome to hear. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's going to about wrap up our time here on this midweek supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 99. We mentioned a lot of stuff in the show and we mentioned, uh, you know, folks are staying home a lot more and not getting out. So, uh, you know, maybe not making a lot of uh, purchases except for necessary purchases. But if there's anything you can buy on Amazon that that you need, uh, we would love it if you would use our affiliate link up front, letting you know we do get a small commission on the, the stuff you buy through Amazon, but it doesn't increase the price you pay at all. We just get a small portion from Amazon. So if you're so inclined to support the show, go to the knifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon, make your purchases, and we say thanks in advance for doing so. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. I want to thank you for joining us on episode number 99 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.